and now look to the very Reverend Professor Martin Percy, Christ Church, to close the case for the opposition. Here, here. Uh, President, uh, Librarian, Treasurer and uh, Secretary, thank you very much indeed for the invitation this evening. It's uh, very good to be with you. Thank you to our speakers as well. I wish that uh, Karl Marx had been able to meet with uh, a more contemporary philosopher, Catherine Bell. Catherine Bell said that, that we construct religion and science is not the problem, that we forget that we have made them. That's the problem. And what she was saying in that was that actually there's an element of humanity in all our faith and indeed in all our philosophy. It's really unsurprising that Marx says what he says about religion being an opiate. He's reaching for an analogy and it's an effective one as well. Of course religion if it's doing its job, will help you through pain. It will help you through times of trial. It will indeed be some kind of consolation. But in the words of Monty Python, not only, but also. <laughs> it offers more than that, much, much more. Bear in mind that even when we use a word like religion, we're using a very simple old world for something that's actually intensely complex. Religion simply means to bind together humanity and divinity, pain and suffering with joy and ecstasy. Religion is the name we give to something that we can't actually fully express in words. It's even beyond poetry and art it's beyond sometimes our imaginations. So I don't think there's anything wrong with Marx saying religion is an opiate for the people, heart in a heartless world, soul in a soulless world. Of course it's there in the right quantities, pharmacologically if you like, to provide comfort and alleviation. But it does a great deal more than that. Many years ago, a writer called Tom Tweed said that religion had four main functions. To intensify joy, to confront suffering, to make homes, and to cross boundaries. It does all of those things. And when I think about religion in the context of a debate like tonight, I think of some of the remarkable but quite popular pieces of work where people have tried to wrestle with pain and suffering and they might well have reached for opiates, drugs or whatever. I think particularly of a man called Harold Kushner who wrote a best-selling book when bad things happen to good people. Kushner's a Jewish rabbi, lived in New York and wanted to know how you processed what happened when people prayed very hard but nonetheless did not get their way. And in his remarkable little book, he works his way through all kinds of things to do with prayer, pondering the activity and the presence of God in his life. He had cause to write. He lost his son at the age of 14. His son died at 14 from a congenital disease. All the prayers that Kushner had prayed didn't work. Is religion an opiate? Kushner said no. Kushner said real faith doesn't get you out of life, it doesn't take you away from life, it takes you through life. It takes you through the valley of the shadow. It enables you to deal with suffering. It doesn't inoculate you against it. It is, in other words, as Tom Tweed said, sometimes there to intensify joy, sometimes there to confront suffering, sometimes it helps you make a home, sometimes it crosses a boundary. 
Krishna was a faithful rabbi. And it won't surprise any of you in the room to know that uh, I, in my professional capacity, follow another faithful rabbi. And this is the heart, it seems to me, of religion. It's not just about keeping you where you are and comforting you. It's radical and intense, socially transcendent and life transforming. If you could get into a time machine and travel back to the first century and go to those very early Christian churches, you would discover something strange and shocking about them. The presence of women, the presence of other people from other walks of life, of different colours, ethnic backgrounds and creeds, children running around. And most radically of all, in those first Christian assemblies, people wandering around with tattoos. Now, of course, you might think today that tattoos are bespoke art for the bourgeois. Wonderful they are too. (laughs) But in the first century, tattoos were the mark of a slave. The more tattoos you had, the more times you have been bought and sold. They were, if you like, the first century equivalent of the barcode. They told you who you were owned by and what your value was. The radical proposition of the early Christian church following that other faithful rabbi was that in Christ there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free black or white, upper, lower, middle, class, all one in a moment, all one. And that oneness was a statement about the radical nature of a new society that was to be born. Did it take people into a comfort zone? No. It took them to the Colosseum in droves to be martyred. It took them to their own crosses. It took them sometimes joyfully to death. It took them to have their own blood spilt because they believed this world that they were giving birth to was even more radical than the world that they lived in. That's got nothing to do with mere comfort. That's got something to do with a radical proposition for a world that you and I, all of us, are still waiting to see. And religion had a vision for that world. So I simply want to say to you on this motion, forget about religion being something that simply deadens pain. These days, the things that deaden pain are secularism, consumerism, and shopping. (laughs) They're boring and they're a distraction. If you want to live a life alive, a life that's intense, embrace a faith and you will discover something much more real and much more radical. And it's got nothing to do with mere comfort and everything to do with a truly intense, fully human life. Thank you.